Welcome everyone to today's professional learning opportunity. We are all learning through this unprecedented time of uncertainty in our country. So thank you all for joining together and come and learning with us this afternoon. Our goal is to increase knowledge of how to scale collaboration in a virtual world so that we can all ensure learning continuity for our youth. School is not one place. School is wherever learning takes place. Your partners are here to support you and to build understanding among all of us as chief learners in our schools and in our districts. AASA, the Superintendents Association, has partnered with the leaders from the Consortium for School Networking, COSIN, and Digital Promise to bring you this webinar series. I'm Valerie Truesdale, and I am honored to be a member of staff at AASA and also a board member for COSIN. So on behalf of Dan Dominich at AASA, Keith Kruger of COSIN, and Karen Cater of Digital Promise, I wanna say that we salute you all for your courageous leadership in leading at this time of uncertainty as we all try to navigate a virtual world in this viral spring that we're having. It is my great honor to introduce to you Keith Kruger, CEO of COSIN. Keith? Thanks, Valerie. <clears throat> it's great to uh, be here today with so many of you. Uh, uh, as we sit back in our homes and, uh, and connect. Uh, I think this conversation today is really important, and I do want to thank uh, AASA for partnering with us and for uh, Digital Promise for sharing their great expertise. Uh, the focus of today's conversation is going to be around how we provide great adult learning using these sort of virtual tools. And uh, over the last week, we've spent considerable time talking to our two experts that I'll introduce in just a moment. And I know we've learned all kinds of practical knowledge about how to pull off a successful, uh, really large event. And I know that's particularly timely for COSIN because uh, just last week we, we announced that our annual conference of 1,000 people is going virtual. Our new motto is stay calm, go virtual. So with that, I do want to introduce our two presenters because they have a ton of information to present. The first is uh, Dan Foreman. He's manager of professional learning with the Verizon uh, Innovative Learning Schools Initiative, or VIL, there at Digital Promise. And he's going to be joined by Diane Borsch, who is technical project director at Digital Promise. And from my perspective, the second of my bosses that you're hearing from, the first being Valerie, but uh, Diane is also a board member of COSIN. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan. I know he has tons of things to share, and thanks so much. And I'm going to turn off my camera to save my bandwidth. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just shared my screen. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, so I am, yes, the Manager of Professional Learning for Verizon Innovative Learning Schools, which is a program managed by Digital Promise. Uh, I live my life virtually, so I'm going to throw out a few norms so that I can get everybody used to this whole thing. Um, for my norms is to participate and share ideas in the chat. Uh, I also tend to go pretty flexibly as to how this will work. Ask your questions. We'll have somebody unmute and ask those questions directly to me so that we can go through it. I've got a ton of information for you, so uh, just bear with me, it's gonna be a bit like drinking from a fire hose. But my other norm is I would love to see your smiling face on video unless bandwidth is an issue where you are. I know that everybody is struggling with that, but it's just a matter of being able to connect with each other through this virtual space, enabling that physical uh, boundary to be uh, bridged so that we can all be able to see each other and see each other smiling together. So I appreciate that, thank you. Um, so this is Breakthrough Mindsets, virtual collaboration and learning continuity. So uh, myself and Diane, we work together on this very uh, interesting project, uh, the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools for Digital Promise. If you want to learn more, that is our webpage, verizon.digitalpromise.org. Um, and I will let Diane introduce herself So as we go through this entire process. 
Hi, everybody. So good to see you. Uh, yes, I'm Diane Dirsch and I'm Technical Project Director uh, here at Digital Promise. I was a former uh, classroom teacher, Director of Technology, and then Chief Technology Information Officer. And so the skills that I gained out there uh, as being a teacher, classroom teacher, as well as uh, director and chief who serves on a superintendent's cabinet really brought to light as I was participating in our Digital Promise virtual conference, brought to light how important this learning is. And so I brought this idea forward to Keith. I said, hey, I know that this has successfully been done um, you know, by, by us and many others. And so I'm really happy for this opportunity to share that information with you so that you consider, can consider um, how you might bring this to your area as well. And I'm Dan Foreman, uh, you know, Manager or Associate Director of Professional Learning for this program. So I focus on the professional learning side. Uh, I've been a, a teacher, a coach, uh, instructional technology coach, um, and then a Director of Instructional Technology in Alexandria City Public Schools, where we did a full district one-to-one. -one. That led me to my work here uh, at Digital Promise and being able to spread this wide. So our agenda for today, we're gonna to start with why in the line of demarcation and I'll explain exactly what that means. I'm also gonna talk about bills in the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools because I think that that is important to understand why we had to do a virtual conference and why we had to set this up. I'm gonna give you a couple of key points to think about as well as our setup and our call for proposals and schedule creation, how we work through that process, what the settings were for what, how we command and controlled this entire thing what it looks like to sync with people who are presenting who have never presented virtually before and the skills that they need to be successful, how you over communicate with your attendees since you can't physically be in the same space and structure it in that way, and then your simple support for moderators, giving, very, uh, giving all of the people that are part of this very simple tasks so that they can be uh, successful with this process. And then I'm gonna talk about letting go of control because at a certain point, when I talk about the line of demarcation, you have to let go of control because it's a lot more difficult to turn this on a dime than it is in many other ways. You have to kind of trust your systems. So in light of everything, I like to get to know my audience. So what I would love for everybody to do is to go to menti.com and use this code, 218118 and it's a slider. I wanna know if you are completely uncomfortable leading a virtual presentation or very comfortable leading a presentation. And we're gonna see the live results come in. If you have a iPhone or iPad, you can also hold it up and scan that QR code and you'll be able to uh, participate in this as well. And I'm gonna pull up the live results here in a second um, once we have more people's opportunity to get in. So once again, and I'll drop it in the chat so you can type it right in to your screen. It's menti.com. And the code is 218118. And FYI, those spaces mean nothing. Those are just there for visual acuity so that you can see them. You can just type it directly in. And now I'm going to switch over to the live version so that you can see it. All right, seeing things hopping around a little bit. Perfect. I'll give it a Again, if you're working to get in, you all you have to do is open your browser like Chrome or Safari, and then up in the address bar, type www.menti.com. It will take you to a screen where you can add that code in 218118. And then you'll see the place where you can slide the slider. Perfect. Okay, so I'll give it about 10 more seconds. What I'm seeing here is it looks like just about everybody is pretty comfortable with leading a virtual presentation, but a virtual conference is a whole other ball game. So that's good. Uh, we'll be able to talk about that today. And then a little bit more comfort with distributed leadership, which is really important as we go through this process, because you can't physically be in the same space at the same time with getting everybody to do this. Fantastic. And you can keep putting those results in. It'll keep kind of changing. I'll check back in a little later. Awesome, thank you for indulging me. So let's start with why, right? So why would we wanna go in this direction? I felt that it was important to put in this New Yorker cartoon that dropped on March 16th, Monday, where all of those meetings really could have been emails and that was in there. Uh, so let's think about this. One of the reasons we start with why? Time savings. We can condense this, we can record this just like what we're doing now. We've got a, a 87 people in here currently. 
we're all coming together, we can record it and more people can watch this. It's also modeling of modern practices by leadership. This is the new normal, this is where we are, so that as leaders, we can model to our constituency the way that this can work and a way this, this should work. As I was uh, telling Valerie and Keith about this, they said this is exactly what leaders need because it's an opportunity for them to experience first what this looks like and then be able to model it afterwards. So you are the leaders and uh, this is a great way for you to model uh, what that virtual learning looks like. Absolutely. This is also a case for the new normal. Like this is where this is where it is from now on. We're all here in this together so that we can continually uh, improve what this new normal looks like. Because from this point forward, every district needs to develop a long term plan for sustained virtual instruction. We have to have it as a tool in the toolbox and we have to rethink the way we conduct our meetings. Is this a meeting for information or is it a meeting for collaboration? If we're having a meeting for information, maybe I can send that in an email and we can bring people together to collaborate. We have more engagement in this sense, and it's also modeling virtual etiquette and digital citizenship for all of our folks. Most importantly, we're trying to uh, get past this divide and isolation that we're all currently in to enable social uh, interaction. But most, there's no turning back now. The, like the, the curtain's been pulled back. This is where we are. We need to be able to continually move forward uh, with what this new normal is. So let's start with this line of demarcation. So my career, uh, before I went into education, I was in the military and I was in the Marines and I helped set up the center of command for the Battle of Fallujah. So I'm gonna use some military terms as I go through this, but I will also explain what they mean. The line of demarcation is when you can no longer control what all of your planning and everything is happening. You've done all of your training, you've done everything you possibly can, but once you cross that line of demarcation, the plan cannot change. So sometimes we know when that line is coming and sometimes that line is forced upon us. That line for us as education was forced upon us on March 13th in 2020. We now have to plan for this new situation and this new battle that we are fighting so that we can continually uh, educate our students and continue uh, this process of preparing our citizens for the future. There are a lot of unknowns now. There is no precedence for this, and we're all figuring out as we go. So being able to rely to the person on your left and the person on your right is what's gonna get us through this. We have to be able to think on our feet and make do with what we have because there's no turning back. We have to continually charge forward and be able to have that type of a mindset to tackle this thing that we're all in together. There we go. And Diane, for school district applications. Well, again, uh, serving on the superintendent's cabinet and uh, being part of planning for school districts, these were some of the instances that I saw, um, you know, we could use virtual learning for, and we actually did uh, in some cases. Uh, when you have internal meetings, I recall one time one principal said to me, I wish we could do all our meetings virtually as opposed to me driving down to central office. It takes me a half hour to drive down to central office for a one hour meeting and then I have to drive back again. If we could do this virtually or continue to do things virtually, uh, that would keep me in my building and I would save time. Uh, and so there are a lot of really good applications for this you know, uh, new teacher professional learning. When you onboard teachers, there's ultimately one person who can't be there because of something or other. And so if you can record this, you know, that, that gives them the meat and potatoes of what they would have gotten if they were there or if they're even not around, if they are around, they, they could join this um, virtual learning. Professional learning days, uh, allowing you know, teachers or your staff to be uh, in different places, not all in one room or in one building, I think are, are great ways to do this. Um, working with parents, there are so many times when school districts and schools hold parental meetings uh, for Title I or other things that you, know, you could turn to a, a virtual setting. Learning initiatives over the summer to avoid the summer slide, uh, cross department things. Uh, if you have PLCs meeting weekly, maybe all social studies uh, teachers, you could have them meet across the district virtually as opposed to that one or two time a year when they all physically get together. 
so there are so many applications for this. If you've got a large rollout, uh, you know, something that is impacting everybody all the way down to your, your um, buildings and ground staff and paraprofessionals and everything, you could manage large groups doing things this way. And also just teacher to teacher, you, you'll probably find as you start modeling this, that teachers will say, gosh, I could use this with my colleagues by doing these things. And that's the beauty of it. When you model things, then it carries out to um, and gives idea to other people you lead. And so you can grow this. Change management, Dan and I talked about this a lot in the planning because almost everything involves change, right? And so being able to um, get the feedback of your stakeholders, get more voices involved. Uh, you know, you could do that when everyone is together in a synchronous time or even uh, asynchronous, meaning that you could be at different times in different places participating in something that takes place virtually. So these are ways that you can use what you're learning today in the situations that you have every day in your schools. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Let's talk about VILS for a second and what it is that Diane and I do every day. So what we do is uh, Verizon came up with an idea and Digital Promise partnered with them to kind of put that idea into fruition. What we do is we provide a level of support to every school within our cohort. We now have seven cohorts of schools, 253 across 72 districts and almost a quarter of a million students and over 12,000 teachers. We provide every kid with a device, every teacher with a device, and as well as an internet connection. Um, we, only two schools of 65% free and reduced price lunch or above. Currently, we're looking at about 82 to 83% across the network for all schools to have free and reduced lunch. So that's kind of the cohort and makeup of what we look like. But we also provide that extensive teacher training support and opportunity to engage what this powerful learning and look uh, teaching looks like. We're leveraging technology both in and out of the classroom to get rid of that digital equity divide and just provide it for everybody, everybody. Um, so we also provide full-time learning coaches so that I support that coach as to what this looks like to teach their teachers and support their teachers if, through that professional development. If you want to dig deeper, it's on verizon.digitalpromise.org, uh, but that is like my 10-second pitch as to what that is. But that helps you to understand our history of the virtual conference. I physically can't get that many people in the same room at the same time, even with my number of coaches or anything. The dollar amount is too high. The travel cost is too high. We have to rent a space. We have to do all of these things. We have to feed people. We have to do hotels. So let's come up with a virtual conference to get people to connect. So our goal is that we wanted to provide that avenue for schools to share their best and brightest things that are happening in their buildings and classrooms so that instead of saying we're all doing this in isolation, as I like to say, the smartest person in the room is the room. The better way to make a smarter person is to build a bigger room. So let's build a bigger room. That scaling forced us to think differently about how we provide that learning to coaches and teachers. We used to be able to do like full cohort meetings and we're just too big. So we have to subdivide and get this out so that we can have more people in more places and get everything out there. This was my fourth year of conducting the virtual conference. And I'll tell you, the first time I did it, it did not go well. It, we didn't get people in the right rooms at the right time. We didn't have the schedule correct. Time zones were an issue. The organization for how we did it. The first year we did free tools. As we got up and scaled up, we had to get too big. So we had to start paying for some tools. My organization, my tools and my methods changed each time. What I'm gonna share with you today is the methods and organization tools for how we did it this year and that was our most successful year but it was also our biggest year you can do this using those free tools that are available to you uh, but as you get bigger and bigger you have to start thinking about that dollar amount and going out there what i also changed was that method of collecting recording and sharing resources everything we do is collected recorded and shared so that we can have that bigger room space and that we're all learning together that's why we're grateful for COSEN and AASA uh, because, again, these are some really good practices that Dan has been through for four years, and he's now sharing with you what he's learned. So that's going to save you four years of headache. <laughs> you're, you're skipping forward. It's the chutes and ladders. You're going up a ladder right now. 
Um, absolutely. And, and this is one of those things where distributed leadership and having people with simple tasks to be able to be successful is incredibly important. The other piece is the understand that you will not have control in the same way you would in a physical space and you need to become comfortable with that reality. I think that that's also true of where we all are right now is that we do not have control over the reality of what's happening, but we need to become comfortable with it and we have to develop that plan and trust where we're going. The other key is that full virtual requires over communication. If you hesitate on saying like, I don't know if I need to send this communication about what this registration is or whatever, send it, just send it. Assume that people that aren't reading their email, assume that people aren't paying attention so that you can send that out and have complete control over it. You have to have one systemic command and control system. That is how I'm controlling where everybody is, where the schedule is and being able to update everybody. The first year I did it, and even the first three years I did it, I did that all through Excel and PDFs. There wasn't really a systemic command and control system other than what I ad hoc together. Know the job of the person below you and the person above you. That way you can ensure fidelity of support. I had command and control. I had another person that also had command and control so that they knew what would happen if I had to go up and down. The other is for moderators, for presenters, anybody, they knew what those were and I already knew what the slides were and they were already available to everybody so that my moderators, if the time zones were an issue, and you'll hear me say this many times, to get people at the right place at the right time. Also, if you have the ability to use 10 rooms, use five. Don't do and don't put everybody forward unless absolutely necessary. And I've seen it, you've seen it in here, find your zen, Calm, flexible decisions will win the day because you will not have control. You have to be able to uh, be comfortable within that space. Now, the structure. I'll talk briefly about how I did this. I'm also trying to not talk about specific tools that I used just yet. So I want you to think about this in a, in a uh, virtual sense. So the structure is one registration, one entryway. I have to get everybody through one door the same way that I do at a physical conference. Once they go through that one door, then I can spread them out to all of the virtual rooms with static links. This is incredibly important. It's one link equals one room. Those links cannot change. So you have to set personal rooms to moderators so that they can be able to come in and just click on it and start it and go. They don't have to be searching for the link. The same for your uh, folks who are um, attending. One link, one room, don't change the link once it's out there. You also have to tier this. Every room has to have a moderator so that that moderator is there just moderating the chat and recording the session. The presenter is just presenting because every moment that a uh, presenter is not presenting, they are not teaching, they are not learning the same way that this is happening in the classroom. So that's how you have to think about it. What I also do is set it up so that participants can leave or enter a room at any time, the same way you would in a college course or anywhere else. And you can curate schedules. So there's time and a place where you're saying, every single person, this is what your schedule will be. I'm setting your schedule for you. Or you can have an unconference style. Either or, you can make it work for either of these. But what matters is you make that decision up front before you move into it. Because once you move into it, there's no turning back. You can't curate schedules after the fact, or you can't go to unconference style after the fact. The other piece is that link architecture is your structure. This link gets you in the front door. These links get you to these other rooms, and you have to have somebody who understands what that looks like. So it's almost like you have to have somebody who is uh, able to create and manage a large scale in-person conference and understand database architecture, or at least have two people that can work together to be able to make that happen. My this is a really important point yes. because, um, you know, just because someone's good at, really good at planning parties and ordering the cake and all those different things, um, you need to have someone who understands, you know, how databases work, where fields are, where they'll appear here and how they link. And so you're gonna need some data people there to help as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where I say tap your professional learning team and tap your IT team and get them in the same room together. Many places there's a wall between those two places. You want to tear down that wall and get them in the same room in the same time. And you want to establish a back channel, right? So right now our Zoom group chat, that is the back channel. 
what I also do is I establish a Twitter chat in the background. When I go to conferences, for me, the, the, the conversation that's happening on the Twitter chat is just as valuable as the forefront conversation. And I hope you all are having a Twitter back channel right now. That would make me very happy. What you do is you now, when you set up that one link to get everybody in, I'd also have that call for presentations. So I set up that invite first for a range of days for the event. So if I'm gonna have it for just one day, well, that's one day. I had mine over three days. I set the range of days to start the like at 1 a.m. on this day, and it went all the way until uh, 12 a.m. on this third day. That way it could all be there for that entire process. Because if you don't, it will mess with things later on for command and control. You want to create that call for presenters form? I just used Google Docs and Google Sheets and, and made that happen. I kept it simple because that then, when they fill out that call for proposals and call for presenters, I have the title, I have the session description, I also know which days are no-goes for them to be able to present. That way I can build my presentation schedule uh, pretty quickly and get my syncs with all of my presenters out as quickly as possible. The timeline for this, I did this in about a month to be able to set this whole thing up. Um, I actually probably could have done it a little faster um, just because now that I've done it so many times, I probably could have gotten it down to two weeks from fruition to ultimately getting there. But what really matters is a month is really good for your presenters to be able to build their presentations unless they already have one. Over communicate this invite. Send it out as many times as you can because you want to have a choice of presentations and not just accept everyone. You want to be able to go through that process. Um, and yes, uh, so one long conference that goes over multiple days is important. Those multiple days, it wasn't for eight hours, it was for two hours each day. Because having it set up for eight hours, that's a long time to be sitting on a conference call. And emphasize the importance of emails being exactly correct when people type them in, otherwise they'll mess everything up later on. Visualization. For me, I had to build this in my head before I actually built this on a spreadsheet. So what I did was I visualized a long hallway where I walk in. This is like my event um, schedule. I'm walking in. I can see what's happening. And then I say, okay, from here, this first room, this is my large room where I want everybody to come in for at one time. That can hold up to 100 people. It's going to be there for 45 minutes. This person's in charge of it. And this is uh, where they're gonna go after that. After that, everybody's gonna walk out of that hallway. They're gonna come down to all these other breakout rooms. And this is what it'll look like and how their collaboration will occur. I visualized myself walking down that hallway so that I could understand it. And I even drew it out on paper so that I could put this room link goes here, this conference goes here, this room link goes here. The same as I did for a physical space, but I had to do it all here. I would only have one, maybe two people that control this organization Otherwise, things will be uh, completely messed up. So I'll talk about the platforms that I used for this here in a second. So um, when I get to that point, the great question. You also have to reflect on what the end user experience will be. What, how much time do they need to get from one room to the next? In a conference call, in a conference space, that could be like 10, 15 minutes. Here, no more than five minutes. That way nobody's sitting there waiting for things to occur. They're able to get from one place to the next. Um, you also have to think about the second narrative about the experience. This is a first narrative. This is us have me giving you information here. The second narrative is once people leave that conference, what will they tell other people about what they experienced and what that was like? Was it a mess or was it highly organized? You want to control that second narrative. The other thing that I would do is also build reflection and processing rooms. This is why you see my Japanese uh, Zen garden here, because you want to give that uh, your learners that opportunity to reflect and process and not just throw all of that information at them. So the question was, Remember like, what, when, you go, yep, go for it. when you go to a conference um, between sessions, you may use the restroom or you may go get a snack. And that's when you have those conversations with your colleagues. Hey, I was just in the session and they did this and this and this. And so I really love the way Dan said, you know, build those rooms where people can go and have that type of conversation because part of processing is telling someone else what you've experienced so that you can share best practices and ideas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I was asked what platforms that I used. So for me, that I, I dropped this into three buckets, right? And these three tools work together in sync with each other. 
I used Eventbrite for my event management. That's how I set up my event. And then it went into SCED, which was my command and control. That's how I uh, controlled the schedule. And then I used Zoom for web conferencing. I have all of those within those other buckets. Some are paid, some are free, some you already have, but you can also cobble this together. The first time that I did this, I used Google Forms, I used Google Sites and Docs in a PDF, and then we had Cisco WebEx. And it was just, I couldn't make it work the way that I thought I could, and I just worked through everything. There's no good possible way to use any one of these different tools. It's just whatever works for you, whatever your entity has already purchased, go with that you can make this happen, but the, the concepts are still the same. So when I created the schedule, I built that off of my, my form. My form is the command and control for everything. You see it up there, I've got that ID, I have the title, I publish it, I do it. I'm gonna reiterate this again. Make sure that your time zone is correct. Your time zone for your event has to be with the time zone for the uploader so that when they get to their Google Calendar or Microsoft Calendar or whatever calendar they're using, it is the correct time zone. That was a learning process that I had to come up with and I had to go back and mess with the time zones as well because I travel a lot. I set the time zone in the where I was, not where it was actually going to be. You also wanna know what those personal Zoom rooms are so or personal WebEx rooms or whatever those links are so that does not change. That link is that link and it doesn't change for anything. Publish nothing until you have synced with your presenters. And I say that, and I'll talk about that in a second, because you wanna give them first right of refusal. I can't do this time for whatever reason, even though I said yes, that way you can change it on the fly and be able to meet them with their point of view. Here, you know, branding, 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 brand everything that you can, enabling the secret, uh, those speaker tools, get them to upload their presentations as soon as possible. Otherwise, you'll be chasing them down forever trying to get presentations from your presenters, as well as make them share it with your moderator and have that be as a part of that sync. You can do it however you want, but branding and keeping systemic branding across everything is important. What I did was I created a slide template because I was thinking ahead. I'm gonna be recording all of these sessions. Every slide template has the same information so that everything looks the same. I can now pull that first slide and that first slide is now the button for their recording. So everything looks the same across the board for all of that branding to be the same. When I sync with my presenters, you see here, I gave them a number of different options for us to just come together for 30 minutes in a small group. I wanted to assume that they had never presented virtually and give them that option to see what my expectations were, have access to their slide template for consistency and branding. And I wanted to give them chance to play as a presenter. I also wanted to know if they were gonna be presenting as a group or individually, so that I could also set up a secondary conversation if they were presenting as a group or with students. I also required audience participation, right? So the same way that I gave you all a Mentimeter meter to put that in, I wanted some level of uh, audience participation as they went through this. They could send out pre-work, they could set up a discussion board, or they could have video collaboration through a Flipgrid or Paddle or whatever, so that they would be not just sitting and getting, they would have that conversation. And trust me, you're getting a Flipgrid at the end of this so that you could also sync with me asynchronously. But that conversation is what really made things very simple. They also had first right of refusal again to say like, no, this time doesn't work for me. I could still change it because I'll tell you this, you're going to be changing presentation times all the way up until the day of. And that's just something to be uh, ready for and consistent with. That's just the reality of it. Over communicating with them helps with that entire process. I served as a moderator uh, for a room uh, during this uh, virtual conference. And even though presenters were prepared ahead of time uh, with Dan, there were still some technical things, you know, like if they're playing a video, they have to check something in their Zoom in order to allow the sound to be heard. Um, and so just being a moderator, someone else in the room who can help them through these times is really important. And so expecting, you know, somebody to be moderator and do the presentation is probably too much. So be thinking about when you, are, when you do this, having a moderator in each room, it will make things so much easier for the presenters and they're more likely to come back again the following year. Absolutely. Um, and this is part of that over communication key as well is 
for us, we're not a school district. We had to cobble this thing together separately. So I had to use Eventbrite and SCED. Eventbrite syncs with SCED every hour to send emails to attendees to build their schedules, which is great, except you have 100 people that sign up the last hour and they're all trying to get in and they're trying to do their schedules. And I had a, a, uh, 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 an issue I had to deal with, so I'm driving while I'm doing this and I'm forcing this to happen while I'm driving. But because I had set all of this up the way that I needed it to do, everything flowed seamlessly. And the key thing about this, especially for presenters and for whoever's in charge of command and control, you're speaking into the ether when there's nothing happening, that is the best possible option, right? There's nothing being passed up. There's no issues happening. Everything goes silent and everybody's learning and that's the goal. So for me as well, we had to use their messaging system because I can only send so many emails through filters so many times. Um, what happens is every email system Google, Outlook, Novell, all of them has a filtering system so that if I wanted to send out an email to 250 people and then send another email to 250 people, it's gonna shut down. So the SCED messaging system helped me with that because it allowed me to bypass those email limits and I could send as many emails that I needed to. So that I could also bypass time zones and get past all of that. And again, assume no one has any clue of what's going on and over communicate everything. This was part of my simple moderator support so I have my moderator, they are all part of our internal team, and then I have my speakers down below. Every moderator has a, is added to each presentation individually. They might have that same personal uh, virtual room, and that link does not change. That enables me to have now back-to-back -back presentations where people don't have to change rooms. They just have a five-minute silent passing time, and then everybody is in there. And that way we're able to continually have those presentations going without anything extra to occur. You can do breakout rooms, you can do internal polling within Zoom, within WebEx, within all of those, but those have to be set up beforehand. That's where I encourage my speakers that if they're going to do that, if you're gonna be presenting with those, you have to sync with your moderator beforehand. My moderator requirements were simple. For my team, record the session to their computer, not to the cloud because we'll, we blow up the cloud. We don't have enough space for that. And so that way we could share it later. Their job was to also moderate the chat and answer any questions and then report any issues through the back channel. My back channel we used was Slack. We were all in there together and it was crazy for me because it went silent and that's best possible scenario and that's what you want. And you also want to check the attendee list often to make sure everybody has what they need, everybody has what they have, and that you have to duplicate or combine any duplicates so you can have an accurate count for how many people are in your space. Letting go of control. So I talked about the line of demarcation, right? For all of us, we're past it. At a certain point, you have control of nothing and you have to find uh, comfort in that fact in order to thrive in this because if you try to control every aspect of this and control where people are going, control where they're, they're trying to get to, then you're not controlling that second narrative. They're gonna talk about how controlling the whole thing was and they weren't able to get to the actual uh, meat of what they were trying to get to. Trust in your systems and moderators. You have to be able to trust what it is that you built, trust what it is that you did, and then find your zen. Do not panic. I was driving from uh, for about an eight hour drive in the middle of this when all of this was going on and everything worked perfectly because I found it, I did not panic and I stuck with my decisions. At the front of this, you have to put some time in front to ensure enable a uh, smooth delivery of instruction so that everything is happening as smoothly as possible. Now my lessons that were learned was be specific on how feedback is collected. I did not specify that up front. What I did was, oh, I had the feedback survey and then I had the sched survey and everything and I'll just say, oh, feedback will be collected. I did not say up front, I want feedback collected this specific way so that I could have systemic feedback for everybody. My feedback this year was a little bit all over the place, whereas pre in previous years, it was very much a one-way street for feedback and I had a systemic process. The other piece is if you're doing this beyond your school district or entity and you have to cross time zones, put the time zone anywhere and everywhere and encourage people to constantly sync to their personal calendar as updates happen. The other piece that I would throw out there is having push notifications of some form and push notifications is the ability to send a notification to a mobile device directly. 
that is like you can build that or you can pay for it, whatever. That is a very key thing to be able to do this because you want it to happen and hit people at their point of need. That's on their phone, that's on their personal device. And I would also say to build those moderated reflection sessions. Don't have every session be about content. Some sessions should be about discussion and just be in there for 45 minutes to 30 minutes or an hour where they're just having a moderated reflection and a moderated discussion about what they learned. So where to start, right? Where to start is a broad term. A key point here is fail fast, fail forward. The first time you do it, it's not going to be clean. It's not going to work the way you thought it was going to. It's not going to happen the way you thought it was going to. Use that failure to fail fast and then learn from it and fail forward. Start small. We're all virtual right now. Do it with family members. Start with a small group of internal uh, peers or cabinet members. That way you're not failing in front of the larger group the first time that you do it. And allow them to also have that space for fail forward mistakes. This didn't work perfectly the first time that I didn't. This didn't work the way that I wanted it to. So let's think about that and be able to go through this process. Everything you do for this should be planned for economies of scale. With this, for our dollar amount for what we did, I had 250 people in there, but I could have scaled up to about mm, five to 7,000 and it only cost me about $2,500 to do that. I can plan for that economies of scale to get out there to do this uh, based off of the tools that we have. I guarantee that you already have tools available in your district to do this at scale. I was just in some districts where you're talking I cover 400 schools. How do I get 400 people in the same area at the same time? Here is how you do it. Learn these tools, model these tools, integrate them into your calendar, integrate them into your daily life so that you can start having those virtual meetings with folks and become more comfortable with it. Start from this point forward with virtual as the baseline for all meetings moving forward. This is the life that Diane and I lead, but if you're doing this because this is the new normal, Let's start with that and let's model that as best practices, model that failure for those folks around us, and then celebrate those wins. We're all in this fight together to figure out how to enable more of our students to learn more readily and meet them at their point of need. Let's do this together. So, and then I want you all to enable a culture of continuous growth. There's no best practice out here for this. This is just us failing forward and sharing our failures with you to enable that culture of continuous growth. Plug into the tools, resources, and people you have on hand. I guarantee that there are people within your entities that already are thinking about this or have done a version of this or are willing to try and figure this out. For us, there it is, 249 attendees, all of those personal schedules created, a 4.46 average number of sessions that attendees uh, added. So I had two sessions per day over three days, six sessions total, so even though it was virtual, on average, they attended almost five sessions. That is my 9.6 average session rating. And I would love it, I would really love it if you took the time to either A, click that Flipgrid link or scan that QR code and give us video feedback. And I will also answer any individual video feedback as well through that link. As Keith said, are there any questions? I'd love to take some questions. Thanks, and wow, <laughs> both you and Diane, what terrific advice. You know, I, I love your fail fast. Uh, at COSIN, we, uh, in fact, at this, the, our conference that we we're supposed to be face-to-face -face last week doing, we uh, were rebranding our failure effort called failabration because we, we see it as both uh, the, the, the integration of failure and celebrating that. And um, Diane, you didn't quite get a chance to answer that question. You know, if you were to do it over again, uh, or start on a new thing, what, what would you do differently? Well, remember I walked into this as a moderator uh, on a pretty well-oiled machine, if you ask me, uh, because Dan had everything set up. All I had to do was show up um, early, uh, let the speakers in, and then help them through with a little bit of coaching and encouragement, moderate the uh, conversations. So I think that went very, very well. And the presenters seemed very appreciative of, you know, having someone else there for them. Um, I think that part that Dan talked about regarding the reflection room, 
and the conversations that are had by people is an important piece. And so, um, you know, that could even be, you know, I was scheduled back to back, but it, that could be after that last, last session, just hanging on the line a little longer and having some of those um, real organic conversations uh, about, you know, what went on in the presentation and, and some takeaways about things. So I think that's, that's what I would do is, is, you know, make sure that there's opportunity for the participants to talk about what they've learned. And sometimes in a big group, they don't want to do that. But when you put them in small groups and then look at them, <laughs> then they'll, they'll give some sort of response. That's terrific. We're starting to get some questions in the uh, uh, the chat, so please put your questions there. Um, I'm kind of, you know, Dan and, and Diane, as you reflect on these lessons learned, you know, this, this is really about adult learning. I mean, you're not giving exactly the template for how to do a classroom with students, uh, but, you know, maybe taking it up to a 30,000 foot level. What, what do you think are the key elements around doing effective adult learning, whether for teachers or administrators or, you know, I see some people in the chat who, like me, we run professional associations at the state or national level. How, how do we reorient and, and think about the adult learner? Um, for me, and I say this many times, because I train, you know, thousands of teachers across the country of the one, the number one thing that gets teachers to rethink about how they're doing things and rethink their teaching is envy. How do we develop envy? How do we get teachers to be envious of what they're doing? Well, we have to be able to show and display what's happening in those places. And like I said, build a bigger room, tear down the walls of the classroom and show other classrooms what's happening. And so that you're developing that envy and then teachers can see, oh, they've done this. I can see what they have done and I want to model and emulate what they have done and I can pull that into my classroom. Where you know, there's there's no stealing in education. There's only harvesting. So let's harvest some of those best practices and share what that looks like to be able to do that. Um, so yes, excellent. Any, any I, ideas and I, I would suggest um, also, you know, just like we do in the classroom, you have short bouts of instruction, and then you have some sort of participation or discussion among participants or something like that. And, you know, recording uh, things on a virtual document or, you know, those types of things that don't allow the adults in the room to be sitting in the back answering their email because that never happens, right? And when you have staff meetings or other things. So, you know, uh, modeling and engaging people, asking for their feedback and using that time as a collaborative thinking session uh, every time you're together versus just giving information, I think is a key for adult learners and for kids as well. My, my good friend, uh, Mary Messicomer from Minnesota uh, asked the question about, you know, have you, you talked about a totally virtual conference and right now we're obviously in lockdown or, uh, but eventually there will be, we hope, face-to-face -face conferences again. So how do you see that blending of these technologies with a face-to-face? -face? Hey, absolutely. I think moving forward, you can kind of have two options. You could have a tier for in-person coming to this conference, you're doing this. You could have another tier to be able to connect virtually and just be able to see and gather that information so that you could have that type of a conversation. You could also do it in a blended space where we're going to come together instead of for like four days, we might come together for two days and then have another two days of virtual instruction. That way you're not forcing people to spend all of that money, spend all of that time, time away from family. You've now enabled the same level of conversation to occur and the same the amount of learning to happen, but you're able to do it in a more flexible space to be more cognizant of folks' time and as well as dollar amounts. Regarding adult learners, another thing um, to do is to combine the two, just like Dan talked about, uh, because that way you can provide that face-to-face -face support. For instance, when everyone is on a Zoom and in the same room, <laughs> if you've noticed, if everyone has their, their volume up, and their speaker on, there's feedback all over the place, right? And so if you have more than one person in a room with a teleconferencing software, someone's got to mute, everyone's got to mute, just one person share their sound. 
And these are the types of things that I think people need to experience a few times before it gets up here. And so, you know, providing that face-to-face -face instruction and then say, go, go now, go home, and let's practice these new skills we've learned is probably a very good way to make that transition from physical to virtual. And I will say that the advantage of a, a real face-to-face -face, uh, conference is that you get to have a real cocktail as opposed to a virtual cocktail. So uh, we kind of had the flip uh, question uh, from what I've been focusing on on adult learning, and that is, how did you get teachers, um, you know, using these tools with five, six, seven-year-olds? Any it's thoughts great, on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the things that I put it in the chat, like for small children, you have to have parental support around this, and you have to start with that parental interaction of having some form of a parent contract and a parent meeting first before doing this with small children because they have to model what this looks like. So like, for example, having the conversation with parents around like making sure kids are, are bathed, fed and happy and clothed. Like these are like real things that you have to remind people on how to do it. And, and having that conversation up first because for when you're talking about that age range and that age group, you have to think about what their needs are, where they are and how to meet them at their point of need those parents will need some additional digital citizenship support, which is a $10 term, but they need that so that they know what that level setting is and that they can have a better understanding of what's coming for them because this is brand new for them as well. And starting with that parental conversation and you also need to have like the media releases, all of those types of things. Here, here's another tip uh, that I just learned from our supervisor, Lydia Logan. She was talking about, I think, probably her son uh, being part of a virtual Zoom conversation with his whole class. And the teacher learned quickly. The first days, it was a free-for-all. It was just a frenzy because all the kids were yelling into the computer. Uh, but he learned, fail fast and quickly, he learned to mute everybody and then call on a kid then turn their microphone on. So again, that's one of those gold nuggets of classroom tips that um, might be useful to the people you're supporting. Um, I saw Great. a follow-up question. So it was, uh, what happens yeah. when you're already past the line of demarcation for those kids? You've got to start with that level setting. You have to. It's the same way as if you were in a, like, classroom management doesn't change, but it changes but you've got to sync with those parents and say like, we're going to have a, a level setting discussion as to what this looks like and dig into those settings so that you can help them because you've got to reset expectations the same way you would in the classroom. Close that fire. Christine, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Christine Shine, my friend from Colorado uh, talks about, you know, when we go virtual, how do you, is there a way to use that to keep doing follow-up? So, uh, you know, obviously when we do a face-to-face -face event, uh, it has a very specific beginning and end. Maybe we do a follow-up survey, but I'm wondering, uh, Dan, have you or, or Diane seen good, uh, you know, kind of how do you start a conversation before the event and continue it after the event? Great question. So what we do is we could do calls by role. So later on, like let's bring everybody together of, okay, you are a coach. Let's come together as coaches and discuss what you learned and what you saw. Let's continue that conversation. You're a district leader. Let's come together and talk about from the district leader's perspective. What did you see? What did you harvest? What did you want to take back to your schools or principals or parents or whatever, and be able to continue that conversation because you've already got the tools there. Let's build it out as to what that continuous conversation looks like and continue using that tool as the baseline as we move forward. And that helps to inform what's happening in in-person. That's also in helping us to inform what's happening virtually. Because we have their email addresses. <laughs> and so they can't, they can't run away. This is where that over-communication becomes key because with that over-communication, you can also continuously follow up with that over-communication and say, hey, thank you for joining. Here's our continuous conversation. Here's where we can bring folks together to be able to have that conversation moving forward. Valerie, are, if you're there, please jump in. Otherwise, I, I do want to ask uh, both of our uh, uh, speakers to kind of think about kind of last minute reflections. But Valerie, anything that you wanted to ask? Sure, I just want to thank so many of our folks in the very active chat room that has been going on. If you have reflective feedback 
of something we should, should have taught you that we didn't or something that you wanna teach us, please share. Um, I sent in the chat room my email and you have it on the, this area too. You can always send it to Keith at COSIN.org or to me, Valerie Truesdale, and it's all in there. You know, look it up. Um, we have a follow-up session on March the 31st. If you like these nuts and bolts, that's great. I was a former superintendent and chief technology and transformation officer. And what I found is that when we were beginning to scale personalized learning, virtual learning, extending learning beyond the school day, it's all about the teaching. The quality of the teaching is central and important and the, and the strength of the leadership as chief learners makes all of the difference. It is the secret sauce that makes America's schools so wonderful. So thank you for what you do. And I can't thank Dan Foreman and Diane Dorsch for teaching me and helping me grow it has just been a joy. And thank you for this opportunity. What I also dropped in there was the Flipgrid to also continue that conversation. That's a public document. So if you wanna have ask questions, answer questions, talk to each other, go for it. That's another way to extend that conversation. We, we did get one more question uh, from Be Beatrice uh, who, who uh, asks, you know, is, what's the balance between synchronous and asynchronous? What do you, where, where does that, what's more important? I, I think that that's a very uh, timely question because I think we're all trying to figure that out as to what and where that line is for synchronous versus asynchronous. I think um, for the upfront, you don't want to have, like, we can't model the virtual classroom the same way that we do for in-person school, right? So that's all synchronous instruction. If we try to do the virtual way the same way that we do the physical way, then kids are going to shut down. Technically, they're already shutting down in the physical classroom, so let's rethink what that looks like. We can give them opportunities to learn asynchronously, to dig into content at a deeper level, than if I were just to go up there and teach them directly. That synchronous should be, I'm not teaching to this middle road, I am now teaching to enrich or remediate based off of those students' needs. That way I can meet them in that, in that middle point. And that's true of adults as well for that synchronous and asynchronous. You can use the asynchronous to drive and have a better conversation when you're actually able to come together synchronously and have that conversation. Diane, do you agree? It's funny, we were just asked this question earlier uh, today and uh, our colleagues came up with a lot of reasons for both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, but I would suggest that the asynchronous uh, go first to help your newbies uh, learn and understand what things look like uh, and do things at their own pace. Uh, they would have more voice and choice in selecting what they would want to do so you can differentiate a little better and then move to synchronous. Now synchronous is great for again not just giving information because you can do that anywhere but for that collaboration that you want and for the building of ideas and allowing one idea to get better because of other ideas. And so I would say synchronous uh, for those times because uh, that's when you're gonna have the best engagement and the best thinking come forward. That's great. And, and since I'm a lurker on Diane's email, I think Ed Week may be doing a story about this. <laughs> So uh, I, I just want to give both of you a kind of a closing opportunity. You know, if there's one thing that everybody should remember, what, what, what's your advice? Diane, you go first. Well, I'm thinking again from the lens of a superintendent or a cabinet member. Um, this is something big, uh, but something necessary. And so I would, if I were thinking about this, I would think, how could I do this in a small controlled way so that I could be good at it and then start growing it out? Because I know I have to start somewhere. And so that's why when Dan and I were putting this together, we came up with this, where should we start um, tip sheet because, or with that slide, because we felt that's going to be really important 
when people had said, well, I get the free version of Zoom, but I don't know how to invite people. And so that linking it within your calendar so that you can invite people from your calendar invitation is, you know, where you would start. Uh, so start small, be good, and then start growing it out. And I'm jumping Great. off from that. Great. And I'll say, start where you are, but don't stay there. Like we're every, everybody's starting at a different skill level at this point, but we've all been thrown into this together. So let's all figure this out. Start where you are, but don't stay there. And it's more about mindset than any kind of technical mm -hmm. skill. Find that mindset to be successful in this process so that you can be comfortable in this new crazy environment because this is the new normal. Like this is the new baseline. So this, let's establish it. Let's all be in sync together on what this is and then jump off from there so that now this is a part of, you know, teacher instruction. This is a part of teacher training. This is a part of being a, a, a successful school leader is being able to do a scaled virtual conference because this is the new normal and where we're going. Start where you are, but don't stay there. There's no turning back. My, yeah, exactly. But I think I would close by just saying this is truly an inflection moment. Uh, you know, this going virtual isn't just a sidebar conversation. Uh, ed tech is not, uh, you know, a, a nice to have, it's a must have. And uh, we've seen that in this pandemic, but we also have lots of other things and we're not gonna do it all perfect the first time. So I love your message to, uh, you know, get in there, try it, learn from it and improve it. And, uh, and we have to be gentle with each other that uh, we all have a lot to learn. Uh, Valerie, any closing remarks from you? Thanks, everyone, for generously donating your time to us. Have a great day. Thank you all.